stand with us just for a moment. When you've been standing, but let's stand. And uh, just for prayer this morning, I'm going to read so much scripture this morning. I'm not going to ask you to stand while I'm reading the scripture, but I keep your Bibles open because I want you to stay with me. Father, again, thank you for the privilege, Lord, to sing these beautiful songs of victory in you, Lord, and the opportunity, Lord, to just come before you. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins and our shortcomings. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to open your word and allow you to speak to us. And I pray, Lord, again, each one of us will this morning not look at the speaker, but allow you to speak. Lord, help us open our hearts, our minds, our ears, our eyes, Lord, that we can see you today. And may you be glorified. For it's in the holy name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, I hope you've taken your spiritual tums or rollades, these are which one you use, um, this morning. Because I'm going to do a little bit different this morning. I know y'all probably figured out I do a lot of scripture. I always, I believe the preacher should use scripture. And then you'll see a lot of them don't. They use one verse or two verses and then they talk or preach. But I try to have a lot of scripture always. Today we're going to have more than usual. Okay, and that's why I let you sit down there. Um, because I want to let Jesus preach to you this morning. I just couldn't figure out, no, and this is over my heart. I even tried to change it to something to do with Bible school this morning, but the Lord said, stay where you're going. But I want you to hear a lot of people talk about, it. we've talked about that Jesus preaching and how people would respond to him if he, if he was here today. Well, what you're going to notice is uh, Jesus doesn't pull any punches. Uh, he just tells it like it is. He's not concerned about offending you. He's not offend, uh, concerned about offending anybody. So that is where we've been in, in our study as we look at the words of Jesus. If you have known in the last few weeks, Jesus has gathered his disciples and all those who've been following him and and he's gone up to a little mound we call it a hill and and he sat down and he begins to preach he preached a sermon that we call the sermon on the mount which begins with that with a statement that we've looked at uh, many weeks ago the beatitudes are at how our attitudes should be that was the first part of the same message that we're going to continue to look at. And then later, the next part of that message, he compared the Christ-like life to salt and light and how we should affect the world with our lives as the salt and the light. Then last week, Jesus let us know in this same message what he didn't come to do. In Matthew 5, 17, he says, Do not think that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So we saw there that Jesus saw the world or the word of God as God's permanent truth, right? It's permanent. It's his word. And today we're going to see why Many would walk away today if Jesus stood in our pulpits today and preached. We're going to see how Jesus expects more out of his followers. He expects a lot out of us. We talk about being Christians and using that word Christian. and use this, That means Christ-like. You can be saved and not be a Christian. You know that? He said... A lot of people are saved, but I don't know many Christians, y'all. Tell you the truth, I don't know many Christians. I don't know many people that are Christ-like. And that's why the title of the message is Living His Way, because that's what he's going to tell us today, how to live His way. His word becomes our guide to living a righteous life. And if you remember last week, what is a righteous life? A righteous life is a life that is right with Him. That's what a righteous life is. A righteous life is a life that is right with him. So listen 
And again, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna, I want him to preach. I want you to hear his words and what he says in the, this part of the Sermon on the Mountain. He says in Matthew 5, 21, You have heard that it was said by those of old, You shall not murder, and whosoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, who's ever angry with his brother without, shall be in danger of judgment. And whosoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gifts to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave that gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge. The judge hand over you to the office, to, okay, judge you with, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officers and you be thrown into prison. Uh, surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say that whosoever looks at a woman commits adultery. Let me, let me see if I can see this up here better. But I say to you that whosoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than your whole body to be cast into hell. But furthermore, yeah, it has been said, whosoever divorces his wife let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whosoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oath to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of great king, the great king, nor shall you swear by your head because you cannot make a hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, your no, no, for whosoever is more than these is from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist, but I tell you not to resist the evil person, but whosoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn your other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you, take away your tunic. Let him have what cloak is your cloak also. And whosoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who lie, ask you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? 
And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that's verse 47. Let me see how far we go. Now, I hope you heard him speak. You heard his words. Now that I've read all that, I, I can't say much about it. You understand? I could say, boy, can't he preach? Can't he preach? Remember, this is the fourth message out of the one message that he preached. Now he tells it like it is, doesn't he? He didn't pull no punches. I bet there somewhere he said something in those words that has already spoken to you. Made you think of something without me making any comments. I believe he spoke to many there that day back then. And actually, I bet I could say he had upset some of them back then if he didn't upset some of you today with his words. See, six times Jesus either quoted from the law or from the interpretation of the law given by the Pharisees and rabbis. And, and then after quoting the law, he then gives his interpretation of what the law really means. Because remember, he wrote the law. So he knows what it really means. Five times he says, you have heard. But then he follows it by saying, but I say. Some people believe that Jesus was contradicting the teachings of Moses and contradicting the Old Testament laws at that time. But Jesus is not denying, as we said last week, he's not denying what the law taught, is he? He is deepening what the law taught. We've all heard it said that if words could kill, if words could kill, and basically we do, we know they can, right? They can, that's what he's talking about. As children we were taught, sticks and stones but break my bones, but words can never hurt me. One of the biggest lies we were taught as kids, right? Not only do words hurt, When they're directed at you, they even can kill. They can destroy the person they're going to. Like I share in marriage counseling, be careful of the words you say when you get in an argument because you may think you're throwing a pebble to just sort of get their attention sometime, but you threw a pebble. But the thing about words is when the person receives it, that pebble can turn into a boulder. And it can crush them. It can crush your spirit. It can crush your they are. It can crush and destroy your relationship. Words have that much power. But not only does it destroy and kill those that are receiving the words, but if you're the one throwing the words out, you're destroying your character. You're destroying your testimony. You're destroying your relationship with that other person. And if you claim to be a follower of Christ, you're just dragging Jesus through the mud because you represent him. You realize words. Jesus could basically ask a simple question. Have you ever murdered anyone? And you would, oh, yeah, no, 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 I've never murdered anyone. But Jesus says, all right, don't answer too fast. Don't answer that question too fast. He shows us that murder is not an act as much as it is an attitude. In fact, before one becomes a murderer with his hands, he first becomes a murderer in his heart, right? Right? Matthew 5, 21. He says, and you've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, and there's going to be very few causes that you should really, really be angry with a brother, right? If you really think about it. 
shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of counsel, the counsel. And whoever says you fool shall be in danger of the fire. Those verses, just like I've said, they're, they're pretty easy to understand, aren't they? What is he say? I mean, you can understand what he's saying. Now that word Raka, that may throw some of you for a loop. What it does it really mean? Because there's really... We really don't have an equivalent English translation for Raka. There's not another word we can put in there. But the best scholars have come up with it literally means to call a person a, a, per, a, a valueless person. In other words, to make a person feel they are worthless. They're, they're under you. They're beneath you. That's what Raka If you call somebody Raka, that means you, in your anger, that you put them down. You, you lower them in humanity's eye. And a lot of people, do, when you get angry with somebody, the way you look at somebody, the way you approach them, the words you may say, you, you just crush them. They're, you say, you're, you're, you're nothing. There may be that moment sometimes when we just want attention and we try to build ourselves up by putting others down. Maybe that time you just want to feel better about yourself. But using a word or words to make others feel less about themselves, people, it's wrong in the sight of God. It's wrong. Because He knows us, right? He knows us. To Him, everyone has great value. Everyone. Because we are made... In his likeness, in his image. Every one, every person that has a soul, every person was made in his likeness. He went to the cross. He valued each life so much. He went to the cross for each one of us. And because God values each one of us so very much, he is teaching us that we ought to value each other. We ought to value each other's life because if he loves you, and he loves them, it puts a great strain on our relationship with him when there is a relationship but problem between me and you, or you and you. When there's a strain on that relationship that y'all are having, then you've got a, a relationship problem with him. Understand? You cannot worship God with an angry heart. It's not going to happen. You can go to church, but you can't worship God with an angry heart. In other words, you cannot have a vertical relationship with God until you are right horizontally here and out there. If you are not right with somebody here on earth, you cannot be right with God in heaven. Think about it. He makes it very clear. These are things we need to settle here on earth. Read the rest of that message again. Verse 23, Matthew 5, 23 says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar... And there, remember, your brother has something against you. Leave that gift there before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Bring with your adversary quickly. Agree with your adversary quickly. While you are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officers, and you be thrown into prison. Uh, surely I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Then he goes on down, if you'll skip on down to verse 43, Matthew 5, 43, he says, You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. 
For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? I mean, that's easy. It's, it's good. I have no problem loving y'all because y'all have been so loving to us. So there's no reward in loving you. But, because don't even the tax collectors do the same? In other words, the most considered evil people. <laughs> Can't they do, they do that. It's easy for them to even love people and love them or like them. And if you greet your brethren, if we greet each other only, what do you do more than others? If we only greet those who are like us, have similarity to us, we're no better than anybody else, are we? Because they do the same. Do not even the tax collectors also, those evil people, do that too? Therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father is perfect in heaven. I want to close with this. There's a little illustration. There was a little girl who came forward during a revival. Told the pastor she needed to be saved. After church, her mother went to her daughter and said, why did you go forward in church? She said, mother, I needed to be saved. The mother said, honey, you're a good girl. You're a good girl. You read your Bible. You go to church. You never give dad any problem. How can you say you need to be saved? You're too good to need to be saved. The little girl looked at her mom and said, Mother, you can't see my heart. The Lord knows your heart, people. Now, as we begin last week coming from this message, we learned last week, it's not easy to get into heaven. Matter of fact, it's impossible, right? We learned that last week. It's impossible for you to be righteous or good enough on your own behavior to get to heaven. It is only possible by the grace of God that is extended through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you got to get there. Now, once you've ex- received that grace and that privilege, like I've shared many times I've, all my life, and I'm going to you know, when I was 12 years old and in that little mission there in Chicago in the store, when the Lord reached down there in the middle of that mission, he reached down in the Mars pits of sin and he picked me up and he set me on a solid rock and that's why I began to cry when we sing victory in Jesus you know and what a friend people have let me down but what a friend he is when you've experienced that grace and you know there ain't no way I can get there Tim couldn't do it but it's possible the Bible teaches me Romans 5 12 therefore it's just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated, ain't that amazing, his own love toward us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That gift is eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I get that gift again? Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth that you receive the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whosoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you have that right relationship today? Do you have that right relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with him? Is he Lord and Savior? If the Lord spoke to you this morning, I just asked you to be obedient. Would you stand to your feet as Teresa comes to the piano? Father, again, thank you for this time. Thank you for the opportunity to just read your word and sing 
these old hymns that that you have given people to share with us and help us. And thank you for the eyes today to see and the voice to speak. Thank you for everyone who's made this time possible. I just pray, Lord, for these are here and maybe there's some that are following us on Facebook, Lord, that are wheel down the road. I just pray if they don't know you as their Lord and Savior, if there's angry and their hate between them and their fellow people, their brethren, their family, Lord, I pray that you would help them go to them and, and help them love one another and realize there's nothing that should stand between you and us. And you want us to come together. Lord, have your way as we just patiently wait. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.